In this video, we're gonna use Apple Motion to build up this liquid glass inspired slash neon futuristic title bubble for Final Cut Pro. As a Patreon member, you can download this project file and use it in Final Cut Pro today. For this particular project, we're going to select the Final Cut title so that we can use this over in Final Cut Pro. Over here on the right side, I recommend you set your preset and frame rate to whatever you typically like to edit inside of Final Cut Pro. I'm going to leave my duration at 10 seconds and push open. The first thing we need to do is remove this type text here layer that comes by default. Then we need to go ahead and enable the title background. A lot of the time I like to remove this, but for this particular project, it's super important that we keep the title background. The next step that we're going to perform is not super important to pulling off this effect, but it's going to help get a visualization of how this effect is working. So feel free to follow along if you want. All I'm gonna do is open up Finder and I'll just load in a piece of footage for my backdrop. Let's rename this group to be original. From there, we need to create our clone layer and we have two options. One is to create a clone layer from the actual title background itself, but the second option, and the one that I think is maybe more preferable, is to create the clone layer from the original group. So what we can do is select that group and we can right click and then we can select make clone layer, which can also be achieved with K. The reason we're selecting the original group instead of the title background is because if I were to move this title background around, you'll notice that this clone layer is also moving with it, which is really incredibly handy. However, if I were to clone just the title background by itself, that clone would not receive any of that new position data. So this just sets ourselves up just in case we wanna make any changes down the road. Now that we have our original and our clone group set up, let's rename this clone group to be the effects group. That just helps us identify what we're going to do with our effects and make sure that we only apply them to this group and not to our original group. We don't want these effects to apply to the entire scene. We want them to apply to just a specific part. And we're going to use an image mask to pull this off. Let's create a new group and let's rename that group to be the masker group. From there, we can go ahead and locate our rectangle tool, which can also be achieved with R. And we can make this any shape we like. After that, let's go to our inspector and go to our properties. With that rectangle selected, I'm going to click this down arrow and reset it so it's directly in the middle. Then let's go to the shape settings and under geometry, you'll notice this roundness slider. I'm gonna drag that all the way up to 50. If you wanna go even beyond that, you can click directly on the 50 value and drag it further. But I find that I really like how 50 looks for this particular project. Now that we have this rectangle, we can use it to cut out this clone layer. So with that clone layer selected, I'm going to right click and select add image mask. You can also get that with command shift M. Let's drag our masker group into the image mask. That's going to tell motion to cut out our clone group wherever this masker group is. And so what's super handy is if I hide the original group, we can see that cutout happening here. I'm gonna go ahead and re-enable the original group for now. And now we can start to apply our effects. The first effect I want to apply is a blur effect. So let's select our clone layer and go up to filters. After that, we'll go to blur. And the first effect that you might suspect that I would apply is the Gaussian blur. A lot of people use this for this particular effect, but I have been having a ton of fun instead using the zoom blur. And I'll show you why in just a second. So let's select the zoom blur and let's drag up the amount all the way to 32. So what's cool about the zoom blur is we can move this around and you'll see how it's kind of giving me this 3D depth. What if we were to link this 3D depth over to our rectangle? So as I move the rectangle around, everything looks kind of three dimensional behind it. Now, this next section of video gets a little bit more technical, but I promise if you stick with me, the result is going to be so worth it and I think you're gonna learn a lot. What we'll do is select our zoom blur and you'll notice that we have this center parameter of zero X and zero Y and we can expand that and see these two sliders. So we need to link these two sliders to the position of our rectangle. To do that, let's go over here to the right. I'll click this down arrow, add a parameter behavior 
and we're going to select link. I'm going to rename this to be link position X, just so we clearly know what we're doing. And we can drag in the rectangle directly to our source object. Motion doesn't know exactly what we want to link. So we need to tell it by going to our compatible parameters. We'll need to go to properties and then we'll need to go to transform, which the transform drives the position, the rotation and scale. So we can choose one of those values to link to. From there, we'll go to position and we'll select the X value. Things look a little bit crazy right now because looking at our zoom blur, if I were to select it, you'll notice that our zoom blur is way over here to the left side. The reason for that is if we take a look at this center value, the way it's linking to the position of the rectangle, it's actually subtracting negative 1920 here. So we just need to easily offset that. To do so, we'll select our link position and we'll just type in a value of 1920. So we've essentially added that and it's now offsetting. So our zoom blur is now found directly in the middle, which solves that problem. So that's super cool, but we need to do the exact same thing for the Y value. I'm going to duplicate this link position X by pushing command D to duplicate. And we can rename this to be link position Y and we'll push enter. Next, we need to tell motion what values we want to link to. So we'll go over to our compatible parameters. We'll go to properties, transform, position. And instead of the X value, we're going to do the Y value this time, which is the up and down. Again, things are looking crazy here, but we'll fix that in just a second. But from there, we need to tell motion not to be driving the X value of our zoom blur, but actually the Y value. We need to change the target parameters over to filters, which is that zoom blur filter. And then we need to go over to center and select Y. Again, it's all crazy up here. It's offset improperly. So we can select our zoom blur and see that it's a value of negative 1080. So we just need to offset that. We'll go to link position Y and type in a value of 1080 to add that back. And now everything is linked properly. It might not look like much is happening, but if I were to select my rectangle and move it around, you'll notice how we're getting this super cool 3D effect in the background, which I am absolutely loving. So the next effect we want to apply to this, which is really going to make things pop, is the neon effect. To do that, let's select our clone layer. We'll go up to filters. We'll go to glow and we're going to select neon. Now, neon is actually not being applied because we're applying it to the clone layer, which is currently receiving this image mask. So the whole effect is applying inside of the rectangle. So instead, we need to click and drag the neon effect to the actual group. And now we can start to see the neon effect taking shape. So going over here to the left side, we can up our brightness, we can up our outer glow, and I actually like a pretty strong outer glow with a low outer brightness. We can also adjust the inner brightness if we want. I'll leave it at the default. And we can adjust just how much of that glow is happening on the edges. So that is looking super cool. And again, we can move this around and you'll see how it's receiving the glow in different ways as we move it around. Now I want to add one more effect to really sharpen up these edges. So with our effects group selected, we'll go to filters, we'll go to stylize, and we're going to select this color emboss. And if I drag up the amount, you can start to see how it's taking shape. So we're getting a little bit sharper edge here on our rectangle, which I think just adds that much more punch to it. So now we need to add in a title to this box. To do so, we'll get our title tool and you can click absolutely anywhere. And I'm just gonna type in subscribe because I'm cheeky like that. From there, let's go to our format settings and up the scale. And I also need to make sure that the subscribe text is in its own group. So I'm just gonna drag that out of the masker group and we'll just call this the title group. So it should be visible now and we can just increase the scale to our liking. Now what I'm going to do is set it up so this text is actually receiving some of the background. But to make this more effective, we need to make it really visible with the title because you'll see these hot glowing spots make it almost impossible to see our title. So what we can do is go to our appearance and with our title selected, let's just change that to a black color. From there, we can go over to our properties 
and under blend mode, go to the bottom and you'll see this light wrap blend mode. I love this blend mode. It looks like not much has changed, but if we expand out our light wrap settings, we can increase the amount and you can start to see it taking effect. So as we get to these brighter sections, that light is wrapping around our text. And I find that I actually get better results if I change the mode from normal over to something like hard light. We can increase the amount to our liking and I'm pretty happy with how that's looking right there. So now we need to go ahead and link the scale and position of this rectangle to the position of our title. Now there's many different ways we could do this, but there's one that's really simple to do. Select our rectangle. We'll go to behaviors, basic motion, and we'll select align to, and this is great for text boxes. So now we can tell it to align to our subscribe text, and you'll see just like that, we've now linked up both, and wherever we move this title to, that background box is going to follow. From there, I wanna take this a step further and actually link the width and the height to our text, because if I were to change this, you'll notice that the outer box width is staying the same size. So let's do that. Let's select our rectangle. We'll go to shape and we'll find our size parameter. I'm going to expand that out. And now we have width and height. And we're going to have to do these two separately. Going over to the width, we'll click this down arrow, add a parameter behavior, and we'll select link. From there, we can drag in our title. And under compatible parameters, we're going to look up object attributes. These are the attributes of our actual title. We'll go to size and select width. And just like that, our rectangle is perfectly matching the width of our title. From there, we can come over here to the left side and offset it. So if we want to have a little bit of padding on the sides, we can do that. We can drag that up to 100 or so, whatever you're feeling good with. Let's go ahead and label this as link width. And I'm going to push command D to duplicate it. And we can call it link height. From there, under compatible parameters, we can go to object attributes, size, height. And now we need to change the target parameter because right now the height is driving the width of our object. So let's change target parameters. We'll go to object, we'll go to size and height. So now the height of our title is also driving this rectangle. What that means is if I were to take this hello text and just increase the scale, that rectangle is matching its scale perfectly, which is so, so cool. Let's go ahead and set the position of our title to be in the middle. And in fact, I'll go to text and set the alignment to be centered. So this is looking really good. Now, one more effect that I forgot to add to our effects group that I think is really going to sell this effect is a nice little prism effect. Let's select the clone layer itself. We'll go to filters. We'll go to blur and we'll select prism. From there, we can go ahead and drag up the prism amount. And you'll start to see, if I go really severe with it, that the highlights are actually shifting in color. And we can even change the direction of this if we want to. So you can get as crazy with this if you want. We go a little bit rainbowy, or we can keep it subtle. I'll keep it relatively subtle. I think that's looking really cool. So now that we have that effect in place, there's another thing I want to add to this title. Right now, it doesn't have any sort of animation to introduce itself into the scene. And so I'd love to add that. But this is going to create a whole host of problems that we're going to need to address. So there's a lot of fun stuff here. In our hello title, let's just go up to behaviors. We'll go to text basic. And I'm going to select something simple like this arrange in. You can, of course, customize it however you want. But you'll immediately notice now that our rectangle has adjusted in scale. And this is for a very specific reason, because if we were to select our rectangle and actually go into the link height and width, you'll notice this little setting for source frame mode, which is set currently to continuous. Continuous means it is always going to be linked no matter what the value is, if it changes in the scene. So what we can do instead is tell it to link to a specific part of the animation. So to do that, let's change the source frame mode from continuous over to fixed. And you'll see this source frame is set to 100%. So that means the very end of the animation. So if I drag this back, you'll notice that the height is staying the same the whole time, but the width is actually shifting. So we need to do the same thing for the width. We'll come over here, source frame mode, continuous, and change that to fixed. So no matter the animation, this box is going to stay the same scale. 
but you'll also notice it's shifting around a whole bunch. That is because of our align to parameter. So if we take a look here, you'll notice the alignment is continuous. What we can do is change it over to fixed frame. And so now that rectangle is going to stay exactly the same shape and in the same place the entire time, which is incredibly handy. But it doesn't mean that we can't change the scale on this. So if I write subscribe again, it's going to match that width perfectly. And the last thing I want to do to make this really pop is to go ahead and add some animation to our rectangle appearing in. So to do that, let's find the link width parameter. And you'll notice there's this custom mix slider. And if I drag that back and forth, our rectangle is adjusting back to its original scale and then back up to the new found scale. Unfortunately, we want it to go all the way down to zero. So let's set our custom mix slider to zero. Then with our rectangle selected, we'll go to width and I'm going to set that also to zero. So now it is completely zeroed out and we can go back to the link width. And if I drag this custom mix slider, it's going to slowly match our scale. So we'll drag it to zero and go to the very first frame of our scene. We'll click to add a keyframe and we can move forward about half a second, maybe 20 frames, somewhere in there. And I'll drag that up to a full 100%. So it should animate in really nicely, but it's lacking a lot of fluidity. It's pretty basic. So let's adjust for that. We'll go over to our keyframe editor, which you can get with command eight, and you'll see that we have a linear line. Let's just select both those keyframes, right click, interpolation, and I'm gonna select Bezier. From there, I'll select this first keyframe. I'm going to drag this handle and hold shift and lock it to that axis. So that's looking good. And let's do the exact same thing for the secondary keyframe, hold shift, drag it to the right, and that's looking good. And now that adds some nice dynamism to our title. And this is looking incredible if you ask me. So what's great is I can move this title around wherever we want, but another huge benefit is that this works with any type of background and it looks just as cool. So for example, let me load in this completely pink scene and now we have a completely different look with our title. It matches the direction of wherever we drag this around. We're getting that cool light refraction look. There's just so much cool stuff going on with this. And we can go in and publish all of the various parameters that we want to work with over in Final Cut Pro to fully customize this. So for example, I could go to my zoom blur, go to the amount and select publish. Once I were to save this with command S and then call it whatever we want, future title or whatever you want to call it, we can go to our categories and I'll go ahead and throw it into FCB's Patreon. From there, we can push publish. And so now I have full access to this title at any time over inside of Final Cut Pro. If you want to take your Apple motion skills to the next level and you enjoyed this style of video, you definitely need to check out my Apple Motion Masterclass, which has over eight hours of in-depth training on Apple Motion. And I'm consistently adding new bonus videos to it all the time. I have a really exciting one coming up here very soon. If that interests you, you can check out the links down below. I have a new pay and for payment plan, which doesn't cost a penny extra compared to just paying for it all at once. Just makes the payments a lot more manageable. I also have a special discount code for the first 20 people to use the code down below. So make sure you take advantage of that. Thank you so much for taking the time to watch this video. And I cannot wait to see you in the next one.